Well, thank you for coming on this module of uh, benefits and business cases. We're going to have a whiz through how we use benefits management products to produce quality business cases. Um, the presentation is on behalf of the healthcare project delivery community. And if you feel like joining us, please follow the bit.ly link that's on screen. So we'll start with having an overview of what the business case model is. Um, the Treasury sets up uh, three stages of a business case, three iterations. So they're not completely new documents each time. Each version of it builds on the previous. And they start with the strategic outline case. Now, the strategic outline case, the purpose of it is to determine whether what you're talking about investigating is a problem or need or opportunity that the organisation really needs to fix. Does it actually fit with their strategy? And what you want is uh, permission to investigate options. So it may be that you've identified that you have a particular area the organisation could succeed better in and you're going to investigate options for fixing that need or problem or meeting that opportunity. The second phase or the second iteration is the outline business case. And this is the chunky one. This is where you outline all of your options, show how you've narrowed them to a short list. And if you are going out to tender, if you are doing something that involves a procurement, you produce the tender documentation where you're putting out to tender to suppliers to produce the chosen option. The full business case is actually the one that should have the least amount of work because the full business case is about saying we have received these tenders, we've identified one which uh, the supplier can meet our needs of our chosen option, within our price and for an acceptable level of risk. So it's confirmation that uh, this option still fits the strategic need, because of course that can change in the, in the time it takes to produce a business case. And then it's permission to go ahead and sign the deal and spend the money. Even if you're not going to procurement, it's still permission to spend money and use resources internally. So it's still just as important. Now, just to confuse us all, the Treasury also has the five cases, and I'm going to call them chapters because really that's what they are. They're chapters of your business case. So just to keep it a bit less confusing, we'll call them the chapters. And these appear in all three of those business cases, the strategic outline case, the outline business case, and the full business case. The first one is the strategic case. That was a bit confusing. The strategic chapter of the strategic outline business case or whichever business case you're writing but it's about your strategic fit. The economic case is where you analyze your options. The financial case is where you work out how you're going to pay for it. Your commercial case is where you deal with all the tender documents and whether you can sign the deal and the management case is how are you going to run all this. So what I'm going to do over the next probably 40 minutes, is go through each of the chapters, the strategic, economic, financial, commercial and management, and explain how benefits management is involved in all of them, the products of benefits management which are used in each of those sections, and where it differs um, depending on which iteration, whether you're on the strategic outline, the outline business case or the full business case. So we'll start with the strategic chapter or well, the strategic case. The strategic chapter, the main question is, does this match the organization's strategic purpose and objectives? So an organization has a purpose, a reason for existing. Um, in order to meet that fully now and in the future, it needs to put in place new ways of working, which may need new buildings or new technology new equipment, new processes, all kinds of different things to support those new ways of working. So the organisation progresses and keeps up with its purpose. So what would you think was the top priority of your organisation three month, months ago? 
um, NHS Digital, it's probably uh, things like ensuring that people have safe and effective and um, accurate access to their information, able to use technology to access NHS services in the most sustainable way possible. Health Education England, it's quite possibly uh, around improving the uh, education and recruitment of clinical and medical staff into the NHS. Our organisations will have all had a priority three months ago. What do we think it is now? Well, this week has shown us all those plans can go to pot in the space of just a few weeks. The spread of the coronavirus is so extensive, so rapid, that our organisations are having to completely reconsider what we do, when we do it, what resources we spend on it. So one of the things that you need to be aware of is that your project could be cancelled, not because it's not succeeding, but because the resources can be better used elsewhere. And this is one of the biggest examples we've seen of it in recent years, where there is wide scale switch of resources from our regular projects and our business as usual activities to dealing with um, crisis, business continuity and so on with the coronavirus. OK, so the question we need to ask ourselves is, what's the area we're focusing on? Now, we talked on previous modules about the problem statement, which is a tool to allow us to identify the area we're focusing on, what's driving us to change, how we're not succeeding, what success would look like and what we'd need to change and what we'd need to do to make it work. So the first box of the problem statement says, what area am I focusing on? Where do I know I have problems? Where are we not succeeding as well as we might? These are the organisation's objectives. If it meets an organisation objective, it's going to meet the strategic fit. And therefore, you've um, successfully made a case that this is a strategic fit for the organisation. It's something you should be investigating, spending money on, fixing whatever problem, need or opportunity you found in the problem statement in order to get the success that you defined measures for in the what will I see if I fix it box. So that's the strategic case. In all three iterations of the business case, it's essentially the same. Are we still where we thought we were? Are we still needing to spend resource to fix the same problem, need or opportunity? Could be the problem or the need or the opportunity has changed. It could be that the environment you're operating in has changed. So you're constantly having to go back and ensure that you have up to date strategic fit. OK, so that's the strategic chapter and it's fairly short. The meaty one, the economic chapter. This is options appraisal. So the question you're asking yourself is which option has the optimal, not the maximum, but the optimal combination of cost, benefit and risk? Options analysis looks like this. You're comparing your total benefits minus the disbenefits against cost and against the risk. You could have a really successful project that uh, the option has huge benefits, has low costs, but you have a massive risk that you're taking in it. I could have another option, which is a lot lower risk, higher cost, maybe medium level of benefits. I'm not saying which one you go for, because that is always going to be a judgment for your organisation in your current circumstances. It will depend on what resources you've got available, depend on what else is going on, depend on how well you think you can predict the future, how stable you think it's going to be. We'll go into that more as we go through this session. So the three iterations of our business case, remember our strategic outline case, our outline business case and our full business case. We have different information for each of those iterations in this section. What we're looking for is options which overcome the items that we put in the why haven't we already fixed it box on our problem statement. So remember, this is where we recorded risks, dependencies, blockers, um, issues that would have to be overcome. It could be you can't do this until a particular technology is in place. It could be 
it doesn't have the backing of a particular stakeholder group. So any option you choose will have to have the backing of that stakeholder group or will have to not involve them at all. Otherwise, it's not relevant. This is a great way of quickly knocking down your long list into a short list. Your shortlisted options should be obviously do nothing and variations on do something so that you have a range of choices. So the problem statement, that's great. That's how we set the scene in the strategic outline case. When we come to the outline business case, remember the big one where we're setting up all our options, we're going to need benefits maps. Those benefits maps, remember, tell us our objectives, why we're doing this, how it fits strategically with the organization's plans. The benefits and disbenefits, so our measurable contribution to those objectives, our outcomes, the things which will be different, how business as usual will have altered. The things that we will need to produce in order for that change to take effect or be possible and the work we'll have to do. But there's also another key item on this, which is the risks. So on these ben benefits maps, we put risks on them. And this is a great way of identifying which option has which particular risks by taking the benefits map and saying, OK, if I apply this to option one, where we're going to use this particular approach with this particular solution, what risks do I see? What dependencies have I got? What we're talking about is RAID. So RAID stands for risks, issues, assumptions, and dependencies, or risks, assumptions, issues, dependencies, whichever way you prefer to say it. So risks are uncertainties, positive or negative, which if they occurred could affect the cost benefit or risk of the project. Issues are things which have happened or are, like, are certain to happen, which we didn't plan for and now have to be dealt with. Assumptions are the things that we hold to be true for the purposes of planning, but we could be wrong. So we're assuming, for instance, that a particular stakeholder group is on side with a particular change, or we are assuming that there is capacity in the system to absorb additional technology. And dependencies are the things that we rely on. They could be internal dependencies within the project or they could be much wider. It could be that you can't put in Microsoft Teams in order to deal with the coronavirus crisis so the NHS and social care can communicate with each other without having secure communication lines in place. So you're dependent on those secure communication lines being put in before you can go ahead with your second project. And a lot of that is information that you will have had originally on that problem statement in that last box. Why haven't we already done this? And then on the benefits map. Now, I said this chapter was a bit of a biggie. The other benefits product that you will have in order to write this successfully are benefit profiles. Benefit profiles are documents which detail for each individual benefit that you're concentrating on, that you're including, your description of what the benefit is and where it's coming from, who's going to own it, who's involved in making it happen, how you're going to measure success, what resources it's going to need, and a link to risks, issues, assumptions and dependencies. Now, the information you're specifically going to need, or in particular going to need, are the the measures. Now, you could have a different benefit profile for each of the versions because you're going to need to produce one for different options. If you've got option A, the NHS communicates by carrier pigeon, and option B, the NHS communicates through NHS teams, you're going to have widely different benefits for those two options. You might, in both cases, have a benefit of improved patient care, but it's probably going to be significantly bigger with the NHS Teams mod, um, option than it is with the carrier pigeons. Your other option 
is to do a single profile, but include each of your shortlisted options, maths in it or, or um, measures in it. So here's an example of how that works. So you've got a do nothing option, your option zero. And for this one, I've chosen a measure of the number of miles traveled per year. So putting in whatever technology it is. At the moment, we're traveling 10,000 miles a year. Year zero is the year before you change anything. Next year, we're expecting it to increase slightly. And year two, three, four, it's gradually creeping up. That's our expectation. We're expecting it to grow slightly. So you're always comparing to option zero, you'll do nothing. So option one, put Skype on everybody's laptops or MS Teams. And here we're seeing the number of miles traveled per year. Well, it's the same in year zero, because in year zero, we haven't made a change yet. But we see a significant drop in year one, and then it gradually creeps down in year two, and then levels off in three and four. So that's putting Skype on our laptops. But also we want to compare us to option zero, because our actual benefit is the number of miles traveled using this option compared to the number of miles traveled if we stick with what we're doing, if we do nothing. So there you can see we saved 3,400 miles in year one, 4,816 in year two, and so on. Now we've got another option. You could roll out Skype on laptops and also put in video conferencing screens. So the people who are in the offices, not that there's many of those at the moment, can gather around a screen and do uh, calls and stand-ups and meetings and so on using those as well. And in that case, you can see it has an even bigger impact and it has a quicker impact. Now, that's one profile which has allowed us to compare different options for one benefit. And of course, what we would do is take all of those key benefits and the disbenefits and add them up across the option. So it might be that this option of putting Skype on laptops, yes, it doesn't save as many miles per year as the option to do video conferencing screens as well, but there may be another benefit that outweighs this one. Now, one of the things to be aware of is what we call the Goldilocks business case. One porridge is too hot, one porridge is too cold, and one is just perfect. And you often see business cases where you can tell somebody's constructed it so that their chosen option is perfect. And the other options you're comparing it to are too hot and too cold. And you can see it's happening. So we need to challenge that in order to make sure that the options you're comparing are true options. And that one of the reasons for this, of course, is if in the future your organization is not able to go ahead with your first option. Say you've put it out to tender, you had your chosen option, you want video screens and Skype, and you put it out there and there's nobody who can supply it within your budget. You can't go for that option. So you need to go back to your backup option, your second option, and put that out to procurement, which might be Skype only. So if you've written a business case where you've deliberately made one option too hot, one option too cold and one just perfect, you've got no true backup. If it turns out that you can't actually get somebody to supply it to you at the price that you can afford to pay with the level of risk you're willing to take. So that's Goldilocks business cases. Now, what we're looking at here is adding up the costs over time and the benefits over time across all of these benefit profiles. Now, it's been really important that we look at the individual benefit risks. You know, we've got risks, for instance, that uh, the technology can't be delivered on time, or maybe we have a risk that we don't have capacity in ICT to support it. But we forget that we also need to think about what I call the existential risks, the risks which are not specifically internal to a particular option, um, but actually they are cumulative across the whole option. Because while your costs are greater than your benefits, 
you're in what's called the zone of anxiety. So at this point, you haven't got back as much value, as much benefit as you've put money in. Now, in this particular chapter, the economic chapter, we're not necessarily talking cash in your pocket. We're talking any benefit that we can put a financial value on. But while we've spent more than we've got back, we're in what's called the zone of anxiety. So one of the key pieces of information which needs to go into that options appraisal is not just how big is my return on investment, but actually when do I break even? The earlier that I break even and the earlier that I reach the minimum level of return that the organization is looking for, the safer that option is. So it might be that I have an option where I don't get as much over the whole life of the solution. And don't forget, you need to include the costs of decommissioning it at the end of its natural life. Um, but also, I want to look at ones which may pay back earlier. And the reason for that is because we're working in dynamic environments. We've seen it over the past couple of weeks where our priorities have radically changed even in the past few days. Yes, there's short term changes. Once the crisis is over, we will go back and look again at what we need to achieve as an organization. But of course, events over the next few months may also change the purposes of our organization altogether and completely change what it is we need to achieve. So you're making a judgment for your organization for this particular project, how dynamic is the environment I'm working in? How likely is it that the world is gonna change so much that my project becomes irrelevant before I've got the value back that's equal to the amount of money I put in? Because at least then we've not wasted money. So here's an example. First project, it's got a return on investment of four to one. So for every pound I put in, I get four pounds back. That's big value, but it takes four years to break even. I spend four years in the zone of anxiety. I have four years during which changes outside of my control, such as coronavirus, such as a change of government, such as uh, mergers of organizations, or just the usual changes in research, in knowledge, in government policy, four years during which my project could become irrelevant but it has a big payoff. I've got another project. It's got a smaller return on investment. It gets three pounds back for every pound I put in, but it breaks even much, much quicker. I'm not saying go for project B. I'm saying that every time you do this, your organization, the purpose of the business case is to put a proposition to your organization. They will need to make a decision how dynamic do they think the environment is? How much risk are they willing to take? Not just the individual risk of do we have IT capacity? Do we have this? Do we have the backing of that stakeholder group? But actually, how likely is it that the option becomes irrelevant before it's paid back, before we reach break even? At the moment, I think I would certainly be uh, looking for the ones that have the shorter payback periods, but hey, we'll see what happens when we get through this. Of course, remember your project may be canceled, not because it's not effective, not because it's not doing well, but because the resources are needed elsewhere. This isn't what we're tracking on a risk register. This is existential risk, as I call it. So we've talked about options analysis and that is the point of the economic chapter. The economic chapter is the net benefit. That's what I worked out in the benefit profile compared to the cost that was on my graph compared to the risk and it's the risk within the individual uh, option and you'll have costed up your risk register, your contingency plans, your mitigation costs but also that existential risk around break even as well as return on investment. Now, it sounds 
that's really meaty, but there's additional work to be done on this. When you get to your short list, your really short, short list, just one or two options, you also need to do scenario analysis. So there's always going to be your best case scenario. Yes, if everything goes totally to plan, we'll get X amount of benefit. It'll cost Y. Our level of risk expenditure will be Z. But you also need to think about what's the worst case scenario. So it could be you have an option which it goes best case is absolutely brilliant. It breaks even really quickly. It's a great return on investment. But what's the what's the likely worst case scenario? What happens if you don't get the backing of that stakeholder group? What happens if the risks you identified in your risk register come true and become issues? How much benefit would you get then and how much would it cost you to get it? So that's the worst case scenario. That's going to inform your tolerances. How much variation can I afford? How much is acceptable? So when you're actually implementing and you discover that, well, yeah, this stakeholder group a little resistant, it slowed us down a bit. Is that an acceptable amount of delay? An acceptable amount of benefit that's therefore been lost? But what we also want to know is the realistic case. Yes, we've got our tolerances. The organization then uses those as, as danger signals. If we're heading towards this tolerance, we need to take a look at this project. Internally in the project, it might be what can we do to bring it back on track? Externally, it might be, is there something better we can do with the resources? But the realistic case is what you use for planning. So you're saying, yes, my, my, my business case, it could save 10 million pounds in my best case scenario. My worst case scenario, it could save 2 million pounds. What's your realistic one somewhere in between the two? And remember, of course, we're all biased. We all think we're better project managers than average. We all think that we'll be more successful than everyone else at overcoming challenges. Uh, we all look at things which agree with this more favorably than things which disagree with what we think. So we've got to be careful when calculating our realistic case. So that's the meaty, meaty chapter, the economic case. So we've looked at what is the best combination, the optimal combination of cost and benefit and risk. We've looked at which one is going to break even earlier because that's part of our assessment of that risk. We've looked at what's our worst case scenario. What happens if everything goes wrong? What do we get if everything goes completely right and decided on a realistic case to track against? So that's that chapter. Right, the financial case then, or the financial chapter. Financial chapter is which option is most affordable? How am I gonna pay for this? Now, you might think, well, that's that's about funding sources. That's about negotiation with commissioners and and so on and so forth. And yes, it is. But it's also about cash releasing benefits. And by cash releasing, I mean savings and income. So we're able to sell off this building because we've emptied it and, and moved to a new facility or we are able to um, reduce our running costs, for instance. We're using less electricity because we've got solar panels, or we are traveling less because we're using Skype more. Now, these are specifically the ones, they're the money in your pocket benefits. And what it's about is recycling. You want to recycle those cash releasing benefits to pay for the running costs. Because, of course, once you've implemented your project and you've put in your new building or your new process or your new piece of technology, it isn't free. It's got a running cost. But if you're saving money somewhere else, perhaps you're able to recycle it. One of the big difficulties we face in the NHS is the savings may happen in a different organisation. to so the ones that are incurring the running costs and the ones who paid for the project in the first place. So that's when you're looking at, for instance, situations like uh, the Leeds care record and uh, the devolved Manchester areas where instead of 
looking at it as individual budgets for social care, for public health, for NHS, acute, for GPs and so on. It's seen as one system and one pot. Very much part of systems thinking. So we're still looking at the same graph and we're still looking at the same costs. But when you calculate the benefits, you're only calculating it on those cash in your pocket ones, the cash releasing or the savings benefits. So you still will have a zone of anxiety where you've put more money in than you're getting money back, not value, but money. And the quicker you break even, the less time it's having an impact, it's tying up resources that could be working on something else. Once you've broken even, it starts to pay for those resources. They can either, you can either hire extra ones or you can um, pay for the extras you've got and release time back to the organization for them to, to do other things, do new projects. So economic case has this graph in, but it's calculated on all of the benefits that have a financial value. The financial case is about affordability. So it's calculated on savings um, and income. And of course, we've got to remember, we may have projects which don't have any cash savings or at least don't have enough that we'd break even. Because a lot of what we do in the NHS, the value is not financial. The value isn't money in our pockets. It's improved patient care. It's improved health outcomes. It's improved experience of our services. It's improved well-being. So we are still interested in that return on investment, but we're only interested in it based on the cash on this particular chapter. So let's have a look at project A again. It's return on investment against all benefits that have a financial value was four to one and it was going to break even in four years. But what I want to know in this chapter is what its return on investment is, I should say cash only. The return on investment cash only is two to one, for instance, and its break even is six years, for instance. And then I'm going to compare it to project B. Return on investment still was three to one, and it was going to break even in 18 months. Well, what do you do if you've got no cash releasing benefits? It's not going to break even at all. You may find that different options come out as the most preferred in different chapters. Project A might be the preferred one in the financial case because it's, a, it's seen as affordable. Project B is that one I was talking about where the benefits aren't about cash, they're about well-being, they're about saving lives, they're about improving safety, improving the experience of our services. It isn't always the finance case or the economic case or the management case which wins out. It's a combination of all of these. And that's why it's important for us to write this as a single case, not separating chapters off and go, well, you go write the financial case. You know, thank you, accountants, you go write that benefits person right you go in a darkened room write the economic case project manager you're concentrating on the management case so we've got to write it as a group because our options may come out higher or lower scored in different parts of it and we've got to come to an overall conclusion so moving on commercial chapter the commercial chapter or the commercial case it's about the tender am i going to have to procure a solution might be that I have the skills internally, in which case I'm going to need to bid for those resources to build whatever it is I want to build. But whatever it is, I'm going to need in a strategic outline case, that first iteration of the business case, some idea whether this is likely to require us to go to tender. And at that stage, I'm going to need to research the market. Are there any suppliers out there who can give me what I think I need? So I'm going to do in my strategic outline case, some market research, that's going to need a bit of resource, a bit of money. I might need to do small procurements to investigate options. Now what I'm looking for, in some cases it might be outputs, this is where I know what I want. 
But if we write traditional tender documents that are about producing outputs, I want you to roll out video screens. I want you to roll out X number of Skype licenses to all the laptops. That's a completely different commercial relationship to one that's focused on outcomes. Because outcomes are about who's using the Skype, how frequently is it being used? Do people understand how to use the new screens? Are they making the changes to their working practices, to their habits, to their beliefs about how successful video conferencing can be? That means that they will actually change. They will have outcomes, which is the result of change in the way you work and therefore lead to benefits. Because if I have a video screen that's been rolled out and nobody's using it, I've got no benefits. Lots of cost, no benefits. So everyone says to me, the commercial case, what's benefits got to do with it? This is what it's got to do with it. Looking at what those outcomes are, putting that in the contracts, making it contingent on the success of the rollout, not just in terms of have you physically rolled out the kit, but are people using it? When you tie that into their incentive system, into their payment, they will have a very different attitude. So that's the commercial case. The management chapter then is the last chapter. And this is, how am I going to manage benefits? Obviously, it's how am I going to manage the whole project, but I'm specifically interested in how are you going to manage benefits? Now, this is quite different depending on which iteration, which version of the business case you're looking at. In the strategic outline case, our first business case, it's about how am I going to identify benefits? What resources am I going to need to write those profiles? And of course, we create our benefit strategy at this stage. And we'll talk a bit more about what each of these are in the next few slides. In the outline business case, I need to understand the whole life costs of identifying, tracking and reporting those benefits. Benefits work doesn't stop once you've identified the benefits that you think you're going to get and created a profile. You actually need to validate, did you get them? If you didn't get them, there needs to be action taken to deal with whatever it is that's blocking you from getting those benefits. And of course, the product I'm going to need at this stage are the benefits register and plan. Now, the register is the collection of benefit profiles with the one that the chosen option uh, identified, the, the, the number one option identified. And the plan is about the resources that you're going to need and when things are going to happen. And the full business case is confirmation that those benefits are going to be owned because if they're not going to be owned, you can't sign the deal because you can't spend the money unless somebody's going to have a grip on it. And putting in place the handover plans. Now, that sounds like planning quite far ahead, doesn't it? And planning in a business case before we've agreed the deal, before we've signed the contract, how the handover will happen when we've finished building. Yeah, I am, because I need to know what resource that needs. I need to be sure that they are ready for it. I need to be sure that business as usual is planning to receive whatever product we're going to produce to make the changes that are needed and to track the benefits and to see those benefits is important. So strategic outline case, I said the main product there was the benefit strategy. Let's have a look at the benefit strategy. The benefit strategy is a document that outlines what benefits you're interested in. This is a project about improving health and well-being in uh, a population that has uh, diabetes, as opposed to this is about improving the standards of nutrition of patients in acute hospitals. They're two totally different things. So the benefit strategy, first of all, has to say, this is the area we're focused in. Benefits in those other areas, yes, very nice, but that's not what we're spending the money to get. What are our priorities? It's more important for us to have X than to have Y. Who's going to own stuff? And how are you going to ensure that people take ownership of stuff? What products are going to be needed? Benefits products. 
So you're going to need a benefits register, um, plan and profiles. Who's going to create them? What resources? How will you report? How will you report your progress on developing your benefit profiles and so on and so forth? And how are you going to report benefits afterwards? Now, of course, benefits happen after the project is finished. They happen when the business is running that new way of working for the next however many years. Have you made plans for there to be resource available? And have you worked out who they're going to report that to? Uh, it also should include your sign off documents and how you're going to hand over your benefits to ensure that the benefits do actually happen because somebody is ready to receive it and ready to make the changes happen and work. So that's the strategy. The benefits plan. This is what resources, when and to do what. I'm going to need resources to identify benefits, to evaluate them, to ensure that they are um, still aligned as various decisions will be made during the development and implementation of whatever your product is. That during the change, it is the focus, the change isn't change for change's sake, it's the changes in order to get benefits, how you're going to communicate it, what resources you'll need to communicate it, and as I said, the resources afterwards. Remember your after project measurement. That's the plan. Owners. So without owners, you've no one to validate your benefits and to take accountability for them. If you haven't got an owner for a benefit, by the time you get to a short list of options in your outline business case, you can't include the benefit because you have nobody to own it. You have nobody who's saying, I agree, this is something that's possible. If you include a benefit in the option which doesn't have ownership, it hasn't got validation. And therefore, you could actually be over promising on that, that option. So that means we need to engage people from business as usual as soon as possible in the process while we're actually writing the business case. Because they're the ones who are going to have to do this day in, day out once we've finished, once we've rolled out whatever we're doing. They're the ones who are going to have to use Skype. They're the ones who are going to have to use the video screens. If we haven't got somebody prepared for that and who said, yes, that's achievable, then how can you include it in the options? Now, that means that uh, the ways of working that are going to have to change have been understood early on. And they should be able to help prepare people for that and help them to transition effectively so we do realise benefits and minimise our disk benefits. Here's a little tip, something I've used in NHS trusts and a couple of other organisations of benefit contracts. Now, it's not a legal contract, but it is a piece of paper where the owner of the benefits and the benefits manager, and if it's financial, the head of finance or somebody similar, signs a document that says, I believe this is achievable. I will put all effort in to make it happen. Um, I have validated the benefit and I will take accountability for it. And if it's financial, then it should be taken out of budgets. So if you're saying we're going to save five million pounds from year two, from year two, your budget should have five million pounds less money in it. When you do that, it really focuses attention. I linked it to the performance management system in a couple of the trusts and performance significantly increased over how they'd done with realising benefits in the past. And then, of course, your handover plan. So you're handing over a product, of course, but you're also needing to hand over the management and the optimization and the reporting of the benefits. And if they're involved from the beginning, that management plan should have included the resources they're going to need. So it doesn't come to it as a shock to them and they don't go, well, how am I supposed to deal with this? I wasn't ready for it. So there are all of the content that you need benefit wise in the management plan and the handover plan. The last thing it needs to be there in that final full business case. So we have covered strategic outline cases, which is our um, I need to investigate options. Our outline business case, which are these are the options, and I recommend we go to tender with this one. And our full business case, which is 
yes, I found somebody who can provide our preferred option with the benefits we need at the level of risk that we can afford to take and in line with the costs that we can afford.